Yasoda Nandana Brajajana Ranjana Yasoda Nandana Brajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Banachari Yamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabihari Jayam Vishnupad, Pranamahansa, Paravaja Kacharya, Sotra, 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 Divine Grace, Sesi Bhakti, Vedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Iskan Bibidi, Founder, Charya, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Jayam Vishnupad, Pranamahansa, Paravaja Kacharya, Sotra, 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 Divine Grace, Bhakti, Siddhanta, Saraswati, Goswami, Maharaj, Ki, Ananta, Gaudi, Vaishnava, Rinda, Ki, Nama, Charya, Srila, Hadadas, Thakko, Ki, Prem se kaho, Shri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhupada, Chananda, Shri Advaita, Gadadar, Shri Vasari, Gaudi, Bhakti, Rinda, Ki, Shishi Radha Krishna Go Gopinath Shamakunda Radha Kunda Giri Gopadan Ki Brindavan Dham Ki Nabhadik Mayapur Dham Ki Ganga Jamuna Maya Ki Talasi Devi Maharani Ki Samaveda Bhakta Brinda Ki Harinam Sankritana Ki Brihat Madanga Ki All glorious the assembled devotees All glorious the assembled devotees All glorious the assembled devotees All glorious to Shishi Guru and Guru All glorious to Shil Papa Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, Chapter 7, Text 19. Yadasharanam Atmanam Aikshita Shranta Bajnam Astram Brahma Shiro Mene Atma Chanam Tvijatmaja Yadarshanam Atmanam Yadarshar I'm oh, sorry, I got it wrong. Yadasharanam Atmanam Aikshita Shranta Vajinam Aikshita Shranta Vajinam Astram Brahma Siro Mene Astram Brahma Siro Mene Atmachanam Dvijatmaja Atmachanam Dvijatmaja Yada Sharanam Atmanam Aikshita Shranta Vajinam Asram Brahma Siro Mene Atmachanam Dvijatmaja
Vaishnavis. Yada, when <clears throat> asharanam, without being alternatively protected, atmanam, his own self, aikshata, so, shrantavajinam, the horse is being tired, astram, weapon. Brahma Shira, the topmost or ultimate, the topmost or ultimate, and parentheses, nuclear. Mene, applied. Atmatranam, just to save himself. Dvija Atmaja, the son of a Brahmana. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. When the son of the Brahmana, Ashvatama, saw that his horses were tired, he considered that there was no alternative for protection outside of his using the ultimate weapon, the Brahmastra, in parentheses, nuclear weapon, purport. In the ultimate issue only, when there is no alternative, the nuclear weapon called the Brahmastra is applied. The word Dvijatmaja <coughs> is significant here because Ashvatama, although the son of Dronacharya, was not exactly a qualified Brahmana. The most intelligent man is called a Brahmana and it is not a hereditary title. Ashvatama was also formally called the Brahmabandhu or the friend of a Brahmana. Being a friend of a Brahmana does not mean that one is a Brahmana by qualification. A friend or son of a Brahmana, when fully qualified, can be called the Brahmana and not otherwise. Since Ashvatama's decision is immature, he is purposely called herein the son of a Brahmana. Omaginantanam dasya jananjana shalakaya chakshuna maritam yena tasma shri guravena maha shri chaitanya manobishtam stapitam yena bhutale swayamu pakadamayam dadati swapadantikam. So the Srimad Bhagavatam is sometimes also called the Bhagavat Purana. Purana means uh, old. And it's referring to histories, see? But um, the Srimad Bhagavatam is not a history book. It has histories in it, you see? But it's not, it's not intended to be, and it isn't, the history of, say, Vedic culture in India. What it is, is it's, it's, it's a book that's meant to instruct human beings on the most important, give them the most important lessons uh, that they need to learn in order to progress towards pure devotional service. That's the purpose of the Srimad Bhagavatam. See? So all the different things that, are, that, that we're reading about in the Bhagavatam that are presented in the Bhagavatam, they are picked. You know, I mean, the his, history is vast. I mean, okay, Srimad Bhagavatam is 18,000 verses. That's a lot, but that's nothing in one sense. Because, you know, just think of all the different things that have gone on in the Vedic culture since the beginning of Lord Brahma's creation back what would that be? I mean, well, and there's no, there's no limit. I mean, Lord Brahma's halfway through his lifetime, so that we're talking about 150 trillion years ago, if you want to go into previous, um, you know, days of Lord Brahma like that, or, you know, or years of Lord Brahma. But he, you know, so it's, it's, it's meant for that purpose. It just picks, it just cherry picks the most important incidents from any, any point in history uh, that will be, uh, serve that purpose of instructing human beings who are, receptive, who are interested, who are, who, who are desiring to learn how to most, how to best, most effectively make progress towards the goal of pure devotional service, the, the, the knowledge is going to be there. So that's what Srimad Bhagavatam is. See, it's meant to teach lessons. Lessons how to become a pure devotee. So this chapter here, the son of Drona punished. 
uh, for me, um, of course, there's many lessons, you know, but one lesson that really jumped off the pages to me about this uh, particular chapter is that um, we don't want to be like Ashvatthama. You know, we don't want to be like Ashvatthama. We do want to be like Arjuna, okay? And I'll elaborate upon that. Now, this particular verse is talking about how in, in Ashvatthama was not qualified. He's referred to as a Brahma Bandhu, the friend of a Brahmana. And it's mentioned here in the purport that uh, Ashvatthama was also formally called Brahma Bandhu. Well, I think that's just referring to, yeah, Brahma Bandhu. It's a couple of verses ago, text 16, where in the uh, Sanskrit he's called, he's referred to as Brahma Bandhu, which Prabhupada translates as simply of a degraded. Okay? So, the reference in this purport is in relation to this same incident, but to just give you a little bit of historical background about Ashvatthama, and this is coming from the Mahabharata, so, you know, Mahabharata is, to whatever degree Mahabharata is, is bona fide, these stories are bona fide, but in the um, Mahabharata is described that Ashvatthama, although he was a very uh, pet son of Dronacharya, so much so, Dronacharya had so much affection for Ashvatthama that um, <clears throat> when he found that, when he heard he was killed, <clears throat> he couldn't, um, couldn't continue to fight. And they knew that. You know, the, Krishna knew that and the, the opposing, his enemies knew that. And that was exactly why they devised that plan. That was a plan that was devised by Krishna, Maharajudhisthir, Drishtadumna. I don't know who else was in on it. Maybe Bhima was in on it. But, you know, they devised that plan because they knew he has such great attachment, such great affection for his son that when he hears that he's, you know, that he's killed, he's just, he's not going to be able to fight anymore. And, and, they, and they, they, it was, they predicted it correctly. Exactly what they predicted would happen, happened. Okay. okay, but the point is that despite the fact that he was, um, Dronacharya was so much attached to Asfatami, he was so much his pet son, he, was, he wasn't ideal. He wasn't ideal, you know. Uh, Dronacharya, although he did make the mistake, like Bhishma, like Kripacharya, of you know, fighting on the side of the, uh, the Kauravas um, and possibly for similar reasons to Bhishma, which because he was maintained by them, you know, he was, he was enjoying the prestige, power and opulence, royal prestige, power and opulence due to his affiliation with um, Duryodhana and he, they felt obliged. And now, okay, in, in his time of need, we can't desert him like this. Anyway, that was a mistake. But, um, but still, he had good qualities. And those, the point I'm making is that it's not like, okay, Bhishma, Dronacharya, Kripacharya, they made a mistake by signing with the Kauravas. That's, you know, that's there. But they had, they were great souls aside from that. Now, Dronacharya, uh, he was, of course, the uh, Arjuna's military guru. And uh, so he was instructing the Pandavas from a very young age. But he was also instructing uh, Duryodhana. And he's also instructing his own son. He was in that same similar age group. And he wanted, Dronacharya was constantly encouraging his son to make friends with the Pandavas. You know, Dronacharya was, uh, you know, intelligent enough. Uh, he could understand that the Pandavas represented righteousness, virtue, uh, you know, all the good qualities. And he could understand that Dronacharya, uh, sorry, Duryodhana didn't have a, a good bone in his body, right? You know, he, he knew that, as pretty much every, almost everybody did in the whole core of a dynasty. So much so that, you know, even when he was born, when Adriodhana was born, Vidura went. Actually, you know, somebody could help me. I'm not sure. I think it was Vidura. It might have been Vyasadeva. It was either Vidura or Vyasadeva. It was Vyasadeva, even more so. When, when, when Duryodhana was born, Vyasadeva went. Vyasadeva went to Dhritarashtra and said, you know what? Kill him kill him. This, this kid is, doesn't have a good bone in his body, you know, and he's going to, he's going to, if you let, allow him to live, he's going to cause the destruction of the whole dynasty. Archit is saying Vyasadeva. Is it Vidura? Okay, we'll duke it out later. But uh, he was advised, but they couldn't do it. So anyway, so everybody knew, and, and including Dronacharya, that this, uh, you know, Duryodhana was bad news. So he was advising his son, please make friends with the Pandavas. You know, these guys are virtuous, they're good, 
that's good association for you. But, and don't make, he didn't like him associating with the Yodana, but uh, that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what he did. He disregarded his father's advice. And, uh, and Duryodhana, of course, you know, true to form, he, uh, from a very young age, he, had, he was in um, Ash, yeah, Ashvatthama's ears. Hey, you know, my father's the king now, and I'm going to be the next king. And, you know, you friends with me, you're going to enjoy royal power, prestige, opulence. So, you know, be friends with me. And he did. So he went for that. You know, he went for that. So that was a, a disqualification on his part. He sided with evil. <laughs> you know, he sided with evil as opposed to with righteousness and virtue and justice and so forth and so on. So, and that came through, uh, you know, at a later date, specifically, it's towards the end of the Battle of Kru, etc. Now, later on in this um, chapter here, it's something interesting is mentioned. And this relates slightly to... Um, something I think Sura mentioned in his class. There's this, something here about, where it mentions about how Bhishma, you know, further on in the chapter. Let's see if I can find it. Here. Okay, well, I'm, I'm having too much difficulty finding this, so, um, ah, here it goes. So it's, this is Vyasadev speaking. It says, Bhima, however, angrily disagreed with them and recommended killing this culprit uh, who murdered sleeping children. Here, here it is. For no purpose and for, and for neither his nor his master's interest. So in other words, um, what was his motive? We're talking, uh, I'm reading that and talking in reference to what was uh, Ashvatthama's motive for doing what he did? I think, I think it was Sura in his class who mentioned about maybe there was a motive of revenge because you know, his father was killed by unfair means uh, in the Battle of Kurukshetra. But um, apparently, we did some research on that. There was no specific mention of that that we could find anyway in, in the Mahabharat. But um, there was one incident that I thought was relevant, which was that after, after, this, uh, after that fight between Bhima and Duryodhana, where uh, Bhima was tipped off by Krishna how he could how he could win how he could you know emerge victorious in that fight by hitting him below the you know the waist I'm not going to go into that story probably everybody knows that how you know Duryodhana was more or less invulnerable from and every part of his body was made invulnerable by the glance of his mother when she removed her blindfold except for the place where he had a loincloth and he got tricked by Krishna to, you know, he was supposed to go before his mother naked and, and um, but Krishna met him in the hallway and said, what are you doing? You know, he said, well, I'm going to see my mother. She said, well, you're naked. He said, but she told me to come naked. She said, you can't go naked. That's ridiculous. Put on, put on, you know, gumsha. So he said, yeah, you're right. I guess I mean, I so he put on a gumsha and then, of course, when that, when she removed her blindfold and she gazed, and she made his whole body invulnerable, except for the part that was covered with the gumsha. So, so Krishna knew that, and during that fight between um, Bhima and Duryodhana, uh, you know, they were fighting with clubs, and, uh, you know, Bhima's stronger. Oh, Duryodhana was a, a, a very expert club fighter. He learned it, the art from Balaram himself, and that's a whole other story. I won't go into that. But, um, so he was having a tough time defeating him, uh, you know, because on, on top of the fact that he was, he was a good club fighter, although Bhima was stronger, he, you know, his body was invulnerable. He was smashing them, bang, you know, and it was just like, okay, what else you got, you know? He couldn't, you know, he couldn't hurt him. And then Krishna had to tip him off. You know, and then he realized, he, he understood, and he smashed him below the, in the waist there, below the waist, and, uh, he broke his spine. So anyway, so then after that happened, the, uh, the Pandavas went away and left Duryodhana to just be there and kind of get what he deserved. But then there was a conversation. Shikuni, uh, sorry, Ashvatthama uh, showed up and, uh, and, and um, apparently uh, Duryodhana was griping. You know, he was complaining to, uh, in his agony, he was complaining to uh, Ashvatthama how the, these Pandavas are so you know, despicable. Everything they've done, they've done by cheating. You know, they killed, they, uh, they killed Bhishma by cheating. You know, they, they put the woman in front of him uh, as a shield and so they couldn't, 
like that. Oh, no, they put, uh, they put um, Sikundi, who was a woman, in front of Arjuna, so Bhishma, the, you know, he wouldn't, a former woman, yeah, right, so he wouldn't f shoot because he didn't want to uh, shoot a woman or a former woman. Anyway, so they, they killed Bhishma by trickery as far as he was concerned. They killed uh, Karna by trickery as far as he was concerned. They killed Dronacharya by cheating, you know, as far as he was concerned. And now by cheating, by, you know, violating the laws of Chatriya code conduct, they, they, you know, killed him basically. And so he was very bitter about that. Of course, he conveniently managed to overlook how they killed Abhimanyu unfairly and how pretty much everything he's done throughout his entire life was unfair and unjust. You know, the way he uh, tried to kill the Pandavas by sending him to the house of Lack, the way he uh, tried to kill Bhima by feeding him the poison cake, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He conveniently was able to overlook that, but he was able to focus on the incidents, you know, the ways in which the, uh, the Pandavas had cheated in this battle of Kurukshetra. And also conveniently able to overlook that in, in terms of chronology sequence, his, his things, you know, his misconducts came first. So, no, you know, it wasn't like, well, you did some bad things. We did. No, they, he did the bad things first. And then this, these, you know, Krishna's, Krishna, this, these, all those other things happened under the direct instruction of Krishna. And they were just, you know, to make a point that, okay, you know, you, you, uh, try, you, you, know, you didn't f follow the rules here, so why do we have to follow the rules? Something like that. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so, so that was his, oh yeah, so then he was complaining and Ashvatthama said, okay, you know, don't worry, I'm going to settle the score. He wasn't specific, but I'm, I'm going to do something to settle the score. Duryo didn't, didn't know what, what he's talking about. He wasn't specific. So then, and then right after that, that's when he went off to the camp of the Pandavas. He actually was intending to kill the five Pandavas. That was his intention. But, uh, I can't remember if he couldn't find him or if he um, wasn't able to, you know, for some reason he wound up going into the tent. By the way, this is like, this is, this is really considered very low. It's just like, you know, this is off the playing field, so to speak. I mean, this is really outside the, the you know, the codes of treachery of conduct. It's just like if you're in a soccer game or something like that, you know, or just some sports match. And on the field, you know, it gets a bit aggressive and, you know, but then you can't like uh, take it off the field. I mean, if you have some sort of like, you know, very competitive spirit on the field, it's not like you can take it off the field and just go slug the guy you were playing against after the game. You know, no, that's, that's criminal. You can't do that. You know, on the field, okay, they, you know, they're elbowing each other and they're doing whatever they're doing. But once it's off the field, that's it. The game's over and, you know, you got to act like civilized, right? So this was considered very uncivilized because he was, you know, this is like, it's the nighttime. It wasn't anywhere near the battlefield. It was the nighttime. They're sleeping, and he sneaks into the place, and he's, you know, beheading the five sons. So, um, Brahma Bandhu, this guy was really unqualified. He was, uh, you know, he was uh, truly a um, unqualified person. I mean, if you, he's referred to as a Brahma Bandhu. Okay, well, now, he the, so what's the lesson? The lesson is we have to be careful. You know, we don't want to be, we don't want to be like a, an Ashvatthama. You know, uh, Ashvatthama, he couldn't take uh, good guidance. He couldn't follow his, his father's instructions initially to make friends with the Pandavas. He was siding with Duryodhana. And as a result, um, there's a verse in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Moga Sha, Moga Karmano, Moga Jnana, Vicheta Saha, Raksasim Asarim Shaiva, Prakatim Moinim Shata, that those who are attracted by atheistic and demoniac views all their hopes for liberation, their fruit of activities, their cultivation of knowledge is all spoiled. In other words, when you take shelter, when you don't, you know, when you don't take shelter of Krishna, when you take shelter of the, not the internal potency, but the external potency, that's going to be the result. You see, his intelligence was bewildered. He, you know, he couldn't, he, he's mentioned here as having made a, an immature, his decision was immature. Well, that's a euphemism. I mean, Prabhupada's being very kind to him there by just referring to his decision as immature. It was despicable. You know, it was despicable. It was like, it's, that's heinous. I mean, it's like outrageous what he did, you see? And that was because um, he was a non-devotee, basically. You know, he was um, not Daivim Prakriti Mashrita. He wasn't like, as Arjuna was, he wasn't under the influence of the internal potency of the Lord. He was... a Prakrite Kriyamanane Gunai Karmani Sarvasha. He was under the influence of the three modes of material nature and the, modes, the two modes of material nature, which he was 
predominantly under the influence of or passion and, and even more so ignorance. See? So, yeah. So we want to be careful not to be, uh, come like that. You know, where we don't want to become a, a sishya bandhu. Sishya bandhu. I just made that up, by the way. Maybe it exists. I don't know. But we don't want to become a friend of a disciple. We want to be real disciples. Actually, there is a phrase that refers to that. It's called guru dru, guru, guru, guru druha, which means when a disciple doesn't follow the instructions of the spiritual master, then he brings... Uh, disrespect or ill fame. He, he bring, Druha means one who makes the reputation go down. So he brings down the reputation of the spiritual master. See? So in other words, Ashmatama, he wasn't able to follow his father, his father's advice, and um, he was bewildered by, you know, by demonic and atheistic views. So in the same way, we have to follow the instructions of the spiritual master. If we follow the instructions of the spiritual master, we'll have good intelligence. We'll know what to do. We'll have good discrimination. Our, our decisions won't be immature. We'll know how to conduct ourselves, you see. But if we don't, then we're going to be under the control. We, you know, we will be captured by the illusory energy and our intelligence will be bewildered. We won't know how to behave. We'll misbehave. And we'll bring about, uh, you know, we'll bring about, uh, how would you say, destruction or b bad things for ourselves and, and possibly for the movement, which is, you know, even worse, even more serious. See? So we have to be very careful about that. And that's uh, explained in um, all, well, many, many places, but one that pops out to my mind is in the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, text five, there's that verse where Krishna says, all men are forced to act helplessly according to the impulses born of the three modes of material nature. No one can refrain from doing something, not even for a moment. And then the purport, Prabhupada says that one has to be engaged in the good acts of Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, one's, one will be in, uh, engaged in activities dictated by the illusory energy. See? So in other words, if we, come, if we don't follow the instructions of the spiritual master, we, we lose the protection. We lose the protection. We lose that daivi prakriti ashrita. We're not under the protection of the internal potency of the Lord. And maya will, will, be, will be engaged in activities dictated by the illusory energy. In other words, we'll get up to mischief. You see, we'll go astray and we could, you know, mess things up. So Arjuna, on the other hand, he was surrendered to Krishna. He was under the protection of the internal potency of the Lord. So, so much so that not only was he, he, he knew it in this very difficult situation, as we're going to hear about as the chapter, you know, <laughs> evolves here, he was able to make a brilliant decision to satisfy all sorts of, uh, you know, opposing party, so to speak. I mean, you know, Krishna initially said, kill him immediately. When they dragged him into the camp, Bhishma, Bhima, sorry, was agreeing. Just kill this guy immediately. But uh, Draupadi, her response was, what? No way. You know, un release him, release him. You know, it's, it's mentioned twice like that. She, don't think also, you know, it's, it's kind of, this brings another point that, you know, Things don't happen in a vacuum. We can't, you know, like Draupadi, she also, she was angry. She was angry. It wasn't like she didn't feel any angry. She wasn't like a, you know, turn the other cheek Christian or something like that. She was angry. And, and the proof of that is that um, there's a statement here where Ar Arjuna says, yeah, Arjuna, who is guided by the infallible Lord as a friend and dr driver, thus satisfied the dear lady by such statements. In other words, oh, yeah, so the, the, the statement was that Arjuna made was right after this happened. Arjuna goes, oh, gentle lady, when I present you with the head of that Brahmin after beheading him with arrows from my Gandiva bow, I shall then wipe the tears from your eyes and pacify you. Then after burning your son's bodies, you can take baths standing on his head. So Arjuna said that, and, and the next verse says that um, Arjuna thus satisfied the dear lady by such statements. In other words, it doesn't say that when, when she heard that, she said, what are you talking about? You know, how can you talk? No. She was angry. You know, she was angry. And she, therefore, she was satisfied by such statements. But at the same time, there's, as I said, you know, there's all, there's a hierarchy of principles involved. When, when it actually came to the crunch and, and uh, Ashwatthama was dragged into the camp, she was angry that that was there. That was, and, you know, that was part of her psychology, right? But at the same time, she, she took into consideration other things. That, you know, he's the son of the, our guru. 
and you can't treat him like that. And of course, and, and if you kill him, what's going to happen to his mother? She, uh, she's lost her husband, and if she loses, loses her son, she'll be miserable. You know, she'll be unhappy for the rest of her life. So she was able to, you know, make other considerations. And this is important. Uh, and, and Arjuna had to do the same thing. He had to take her statements, you know, her perspective into consideration, along with Krishna's, along with Bhima's, and then to make it even more difficult for him, Yudhisthira kind of came on the side of Draupadi, and, and then and Krishna, you know, left it up to Arjuna, okay, you got to figure out how to, how to do something that's going to satisfy everybody here. And he did. Because why? Because he was surrendered to Krishna, and Krishna gave him the intelligence, and he, and he did something really amazing. But one point is that I wanted to make here is that... Um, just in relation to Draupadi, she, had, she was considering different aspects. And, and we have to do like that. Druta Karma is very fond of uh, making this point when he gives classes or when he answers questions. He says, you can't just take one statement that Prabhupada makes and, and, and make a, you know, uh, a generalization, thank you, a generalization about that. You have to look at all the things that Prabhupada says about it. When you do that, that's called quoting out of context. You say you pull like you say one statement: women are less intelligent. Okay, so there might be one sentence someplace, but you, and if you on the strength of that, you make a whole big presentation that well, look, obviously women are less intelligent. Prophet says here, and he also says it there. So as if to say that's the only thing he said about women and you know intelligence, right? No, that's called quoting out of context, and it distorts things. It, it, it gives it, it doesn't give the proper understanding. You have to t look at all the things. So in the same way, just like you can't, you shouldn't quote out of context, you can't live out of context. There's, you have to take a lot of things into consideration. Yeah, Draupadi, she took into consideration, I am angry. What the heck did this guy do? What, what, what right did he have to, how could anybody, she must have been so angry. It's inconceivable how angry she must have been. Yet at the same time, she was able to consider that, wait a second, but at the same time, this is our guru who we worshiped and, you know, a venerable guru for our entire lives. This is his son, and, and, and you know, how can we disrespect him? And he's a, supposedly a brother. Anyway, so she, took, she had to deal with it, and we have to do that. We have to do that, and it's important to do that. Uh, she did it pretty well, and Arjuna did it the best, because Arjuna, as I said, you know, he was able to figure out how to punish him in such a way that everybody was satisfied. Nobody complained at the end. There's no mention, at least in the Bhagavatam, of even Bhima complaining after Arjuna did what he did, which of course we'll hear about. What he did was he didn't kill his body. And, cause, and it's mentioned that actually there's no injunction for killing the body of a Brahmin. But what he did do is he removed the jewel from his head and he drove him, uh, he drove him away from his uh, land. You know, he deprived him of his property and he, and he, and he humiliated him by removing uh, the jewel from his head. And um, so that was a form of a very, that's very severe punishment. And actually it's said in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, um, <clears throat> Kirtim Chapi Bhutani Marana Tadachisi. I can't remember the Sanskrit. But there's a verse in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita which says, for one who is honored, dishonor is worse than death. For one who's, so he, he did something, he dishonored him. He publicly dishonored him, and that was worse than death. So uh, actually, Krishna was very pleased. He thought that was smart on Arjuna's part. You see? So we have to be smart like Arjuna. We have to be smart, and we have to be able to, and, and, and the only way we're going to be able to be smart like Arjuna is if we're just, like, just exactly like Arjuna, if we're very surrendered to Krishna. You see, or, or, and in our case, we have to be very surrendered to the instructions of our spiritual master. Then, didami buddhi yogam tam, yena mama upiyanti te. Krishna will give us the intelligence how to do the right thing at the right time. He'll give us discrimination. And this is important. You know, this is important. Things are not cut and dry. I'll give you a really far out example of how, it's, how things, you know, are not so cut and dry. I mean, it's like, on the one hand, you know, because there was mention, I think, in a previous purport about how there are six kinds of aggressors, and they can be killed immediately. So somebody could say, well, you know, what's the problem? Um, Jonatari, uh, um, Ashvatam was one of those six kinds of aggressors, just kill him. Yeah. But no, there was other considerations here. So here's an example of, uh, of this point. You know, uh, reaching into, you know, pulling from the, the history of our movement. Here actually happened, it was here in the, in the United States, well here's actually here on the West Coast, there was a situation back in the early 70s where there was uh, a devotee, he was, um, he was married 
and he had a uh, young child, okay? And he, uh, and then there was another devotee, married, a newborn baby. So this, this one devotee, he went and stole the wife. He left his wife and child, okay? He left his wife and child, and he went and he stole the wife of this other devotee, okay? And it wasn't just one incident. He did it repeatedly over a period of time. And he did it in such a way that it was basically almost taunting this other devotee. You know, it was just like he was just rubbing it in his face. Look, I'm stealing your wife. What are you going to do about it? He, he did it, you know, really egregious. You know, he, it was really horrible the way the whole thing played out. Okay? So, uh, as I said, it happened repeatedly. It wasn't just one occasion. So, finally, what happened was this devotee who had his wife stolen at one point, he went and got a gun, you know, and he found out on some occasion, you know, Anyway, so he, he took justice into his own hands. He took justice into his own hands. And, um, you know, and, and like that. But, and somebody could say, well, you can't blame him. I mean, look, it says in the Shastra that there's six kinds of aggressors that can be killed immediately. And one of them is one who entices your wife. I think was, that's just mentioned in the purport a couple of days ago. So certainly he was in that category. He, you know, he did more than just entice the wife. You know, he... he like that. So, um, but the, the thing is this, when Prabhupada heard about this, that, that what had happened, Prabhupada wasn't pleased. Prabhupada was, I, I was told Prabhupada was very displeased. Now exactly what Prabhupada's reason was, whether it was because he um, jeopardized the reputation of the movement, you know, by doing something like that, if something like that would have gotten into the media, that could have been very bad PR for the, you know, for the for the, very bad for the preaching or because he, he knew what the consequences would be for that particular devotee, how it would impact his life going forward or, or both those things or other things as well. I don't know. I, you know, I wasn't able to get that information. But the, the bottom line was Prabhupada was not very pleased, you see. So, you know, you can't, you got to be careful. You got to really pray to, you know, you got to try to pray to Krishna to give you the proper intelligence. Because here, it seems like, no, it is a cut and dry thing. This guy did that. Of course, he deserved that to happen to him. But Papa wasn't pleased. So that's our ultimate, you know, quintessential criteria that just like in, in, um, in Arjuna's case, he, he was thinking, how do I please Krishna? How do I please Krishna in this situation? What do I do? What's the right thing to do? And he got the intelligence. He did something that pleased Krishna and everybody else. Everybody was satisfied at the same time. So in the same way, you know, as I said, we can't like live out of context. We have to take all things into consideration. But the overriding thing we have to, the most important thing we have to take into consideration is what will, what would Prabhupada want us to do? What would he not want us to do? You see, so if you ever find yourself in a situation like what Arjuna is in, where you're in like you're really very provoking circumstances, you have to try to follow in the footsteps of Arjuna not following the footsteps of Ashvatthama. Following the footsteps of Arjuna means really, you know, be sincere about your Krishna consciousness you possibly can, and then hopefully Krishna will give us, you the intelligence how to deal properly with that situation in a way that will be, not be displeasing to the spiritual master, but will be pleasing to the spiritual master. So I'll stop there. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Maharaj. And then... Microphone. Uh, thank you for a nice, uh, rather uh, interesting class with many very wonderful points in regard to the Mahabharata. Uh, just uh, one question, you had mentioned the punishment for Ashvatthama was to remove the jewel on his head. Well, for, first of all, my first question is a two-part question. Uh, so the first part of it, what, what was, why was that a punishment? Uh, I mean, what, what did that jewel do? What was the benefit of that jewel that he had on his head? He, he, gave, it, he gave it to Yudhishthir, by the way, mm. to use. I think it's mentioned in the Bhagavatam, they lost energy. Like there's something, there's something it wasn't just like a, an ornament. It, it, it's something, some physiological function or something like that as well. That's my, always been my impression, but I... It was, actually it was protective. It okay. was a protective jewel. So that actually nobody could kill him as long as he had that jewel on. 
So that was that. From, so from that point of view, it was a uh, a punishment <clears throat> because it diminished his splendor, so to speak. Right. But the worst punishment was the one that Krishna gave him. Do you, do you want to tell that one? Or right. That came it? after. Did, did, didn't that come after uh, he released the Brahmastra to try to kill Maharaj Prakrit yeah, in the womb? Yeah. Which that was that came he. Came after there. Yeah. He got the pun curse by Krishna that he had to wander uh, throughout the Himalayas until the end of the Kali Yuga. And uh, I, I can't remember the. Well, the, well I heard that, with, that he would wander through the swamps for at least 5,000 years, at okay. least. And uh, with all the mosquitoes and the alligators and all the other things that were there. So that was quite, and he would have actually no human association as long as he was in the jungle. So, right. uh, because he didn't deserve to have human association. That was the point Krishna was making. This man deserved to simply associate with creatures, so to speak, because he was a creature. You know? So uh, that's the, uh, so that's yeah. an important point because uh, Krishna was not going to just uh, let him get scot free without any real, true um, punishment. Even though Arjun was satisfying, as you mentioned nicely, uh, he was satisfying Draupadi and he was trying to satisfy Bhima and, and Krishna, you know, in some kind of a compromising situation. So yeah, it, it got that far, but then finally Krishna stepped in uh, to do the final. Um, uh, the final touch, so to speak. Yeah, so thanks. This, that's, that's this man really, yeah, well, he had to really suffer. Maybe he became a real Brahmin after the 5,000 years. Well, you know, he's referred to as one of the immortals. I've, uh, there's four immortals, Vyasadeva, Parashuram, I can't remember who, and Asvatam is one of them, somebody else. Who? Chiranjeeva, okay. What is this? What are they talking about? Oh, they don't, they're immortals. They don't die or something? Anyway, Ash Ashvatama is going to be, might be wandering around for a lot longer than 5,000 years from what I can understand. So his punishment is, he's got a pretty heavy punishment. Um, yeah, Prabhu. Thank you very much for the wonderful class. So it seems that the nuclear weapon is not a modern invention. It is already there in the Vedas. So my question is, what is the difference of this Brahmastra and the nuclear weapon in this modern time? Well, um, no authority on the subject, but a couple of things I can remember that if for proper, I'd say one is that the um, Brahmastra they had back then was more refined. Uh, they could pinpoint the target. Even Ashvatama was able to direct it just towards the womb of um, Uttara to destroy Maharaj Prickett, uh, whereas they can't do that now. They can't pinpoint a, pin, pinpoint a target like that. And also, um, it was even it, it, its method of invoking it. It's, it's, it's like a different, uh, it had to do with purification of sound, which I don't think the, 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 the modern day uh, Brahma, uh, nuclear weapons have anything to do with that. It was uh, you know, a similar sort of effect but brought about by a different means, a much more subtle, refined type of a means. Maharaj has something more you can say about that. Uh, just one thing I'd like to add, and that is a Brahmastra, if it's hurled uh, at a specific target, uh, another person who is as powerful or more powerful than the one who hurled it can withdraw it, and that's actually what happens in the next several pages. But Krishna uh, advises Arjun Withdraw it. Don't let it manifest its horrendous fire that it's known to, to make. So you could be withdraw it. Whereas a modern nuclear weapon, once you throw it, it's thrown That's and it. it's going to burn. So whether you like it or not, it, it, Gross. it doesn't have. In other words, Brahmastra is like almost a person who obeys a particular order of the thrower. Hmm. Anybody else? Anything? Okay, thank you very much. Gantra Shima Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. I didn't get into a whole like, like in the Veda base and stuff, but I just, I just Googled it. So this comes from like Hindu sources. But is that list correct? 
Those are the seven immortals. Okay, I thought it was four. Okay. How many? I thought it was four. Yeah. Well, I'm just, I'm just saying this is nothing more than just, this is just nothing more than a map. That's all it is because I just, I just quickly coordinated the text. Thank you. 